So we've got a great two-man panel here today. Th these are two of the best general counsels that I know. Mike Ullman, who's the general counsel of JNJ, and David Battisti, who was my colleague at GE for a time, uh, and he's the general counsel of Penske. So I want to start by, we're going to talk about the uh, challenges that you are going through uh, in your litigation. And, but I want to start by getting some context around it. What, what are the challenges? And Mike, why don't I start with you? Yeah. Well, let me just uh, to thank you, Brackett, and thank you, obviously, to Harold and the team uh, for having the summit and for, for having us here. And uh, as Brackett knows, uh, I've been in my role 11 years as general counsel. I'm retiring at the end of the year. And we have just recently transitioned, so I'm here uh, like a few hours old as being the former uh, general counsel. You seem so happy can, about that. Yeah, right? I was going to say, I'm a, I'm a little bit lighter of, of step than I was a few days ago. Um, no, look, I think um, uh, it, it's interesting, Bracket. There's a lot we can talk about, the, the trends that we're seeing, and, and frankly, just uh, the, the discussion that you just heard like minutes ago about public nuisance, um, certainly from the, the company side, this has certainly been a, a, a growing kind of concern of ours, the, the use of public nuisance. And, and it's one thing that I would put in a, a broader framework, which is I think what we're seeing in the, certainly in the litigation that's being brought against us, other companies, is uh, tort liability, but without the traditional elements like causation or reliance. It is, you know, you sell a product, there is some impact, and so the, the litigation is that you are responsible. And I think the, the, just the concern we have is that these are the basic elements of tort liability just are missing in, in many of these, uh, these cases. Yeah, and thank you, Raggett, and thanks to Harold and, uh, and the Chamber. Um, and this is certainly a topic I think, uh, like Mike, uh, I share passion with. I did notice Mike was skipping a little more than he uh, probably ordinarily would uh, as of yesterday. I still have the heavy foot, unfortunately. Um, I think what we're, I'm seeing in terms of a challenge is, uh, and I'm going to use the word, you know, it's demonization, it's vilification of what corporate America is, and that is seeping into uh, causation and what is happening where it's not the actual acts that are involved in litigation, it's not what you're doing, it's, it's more the corporation, it's more the company that's on trial. And I think that presents enormous challenges uh, when you're thinking about uh, certainty, uh, which, which is what investors want, which is what a board of directors wants. Uh, when you're talking about predictability, and when you're talking about uh, innovation. And what I mean there is uh, all of the companies here, uh, our company in particular, uh, we strive to innovate, and that's how you progress, and that's how you stay alive and you look to the next generation. Uh, I think the legal climate, the environment that we're in both regulatory and litigation, almost has a stymieing effect on how to innovate and what to do when innovating. So that's been, a, uh, those have been all enormous challenges, I think, uh, just on the surface uh, for, for was, us and what we're seeing. So, but just to, just, David, expand on that. What are the specific issues that you're facing? Because, yeah. you know, if you had asked me, I would have said, Pansky, that, that, when we were a GE, they didn't have much litigation. Yeah. What's happened? Well, I think uh, when you look back, you've had the proliferation of, of areas. You've had toxic torts. You've had med mal. You've had opioid litigation. You've had, and I think the new frontier, uh, personally speaking, is transportation, accident litigation, and anything uh, associated with that. And so I think uh, the plaintiff's bar has certainly been active in this realm. Uh, when you talk about the challenges or the trends. Uh, what we're seeing is a bar that is uh, well-funded. It's plaintiffs that are well-funded. And what we're also seeing is you have uh, damages and settlements that 
I would say, say oftentimes bear no relation to the actual compensatory damages or just compensating a truly deserving plaintiff. Um, and I think that that's what really is, is difficult and that leads to you know, so many other things, uh, rising costs. Uh, in this environment, and I know we were talking a little bit about it this morning, but you, you know, the word of the day is inflation, okay. Well, we understand interest rates and we understand uh, uh, you know, fuel costs and energy costs, but the hidden costs, and for, I know I'm not saying anything novel to people in the room, are the legal costs, the cost to defend, the cost to settle, the insurance costs that are related to this litigation, and those costs are being passed on to the consumer. Uh, they, they truly are, uh, commercial and consumer alike. So I think those are the challenges in a macro sense when you look at, at this topic. Yeah, you know, David, um, so first of all, you, you kind of touched upon something which I think is really important that certainly the, the companies like ours and that you know, work with ILR, uh, you know, I think we take accountability when our products, services uh, do not uh, function or work as they should. And I think that is one element when you talk about kind of the environment uh, that it, it is perceived that, you know, corporate America is bad. And I think that, you know, you know you've touched upon this a little bit, but I do think that you know, it's not necessarily that Penske or J&J &J is on trial. I think what we find a lot of time, it's that corporate America is on trial. It's that, you know, you have the chance, you know, in the jury, you're sending a message to, you know, corporate America, not necessarily to a specific company. And, you know, this is an area where to some extent you see on, on both sides of the political spectrum. You know, on that, the far left as well as the far right, a real growing distrust of companies. And I think that uh, along the lines of what David said about you know, some of the, the jury verdicts, the damages, Harold, you, know, you talked about uh, this morning the number of verdicts over $10 million. Uh, I think that you know, that clearly is a reflection of how corporate America is being viewed by many of our jurors. And, and one element, I think, from what, what I've seen and what you see in a lot of these cases is you know, the use of punitive damages. You know, you know, I recall, and it's not too, too, not too long ago, that you know, punitive damages were, were unusual, right? And, and again, it was uh, to you know, punish outrageous conduct. And that you, we would have a trial, and, and even if the jury ruled against us, then you know, you'd go to the punitive damage phase. And you know, frankly, because I think we're a, a, a well-meaning, well-founded company, you know, punitive damages were rarely rewarded. Uh, now that it's almost a given that you know, if you uh, jury rules against you, you almost expect that they're going to award punitive damages just because the fact that they have found liability, it, they then need to punish you. And I think that's one element that I've seen uh, has become very notable and, and probably you know, led to this increase in verdicts like 25% that, that Harold mentioned earlier. Well, let me ask you, Mike, and, and David, I'll ask you a, a similar question. How have you defended yourself uh, in the face of this skepticism about American business, and particularly in the context of the public nuisance yeah. theory, uh, which is elastic, beyond elasticity? How have you defended yourself? Well, uh, so first of all, we rely on the facts. Uh, we rely on science, which in our field in medicine, uh, you know, frankly, facts and science are, uh, you know, true expert opinions. Uh, now, obviously, that, you know, you're somewhat limited as to what uh, judges are willing to allow in on the other side. And even, you know, when we present our defenses. Um, but, you know, you would, you would hope that 
science and facts would rule the day. That doesn't always happen. You know, I do think that for us as a uh, healthcare company, um, you know, we do try to impress upon juries that, you know, our company, you know, the, the, whether it's through cancer drugs, whether it's through, you know, devices and the like, that hundreds of millions of uh, people are, you know, their lives are saved or touched by our company. And I think as many of you know, Johnson & Johnson has a you know, terrific reputation. Uh, but I think what we find is that in a specific trial with a specific plaintiff uh, who is a visible face, that you know, frankly, the focus is, um, it's very hard to get the jury to think big picture. And, and sometimes even the plaintiff's lawyers will say, Yes, Johnson Johnson, great company, but in this case, you know, with this specific product, this is what happened. But you've, you've tried the cases, and uh, we, we just saw a situation with this opioid. You, yeah. you have your opioid issues, among other things. Uh, but uh, we just had three companies, big companies, settle uh, a public nuisance set of allegations yesterday. You, you have gone to the mat and no, we've tried settled. these cases. We've settled, uh, we, we, uh, we have tried and then we have settled. Um, look, the one case that we ha had that went to trial um, in Oklahoma, which was the very first opioid case, it was a bench trial, judge ruled against us, but then the Oklahoma Supreme Court uh, d decided that you know, he had misapplied the public nuisance laws overturn the verdict in our favor. But look, at the end of the day, and I think the reason why just, you know, early this morning, Walgreens and CVS announced their settlement. I think it was referenced earlier, the three big distributors uh, in our case, is that, you know, it really is in the interests of the company, the shareholders, to settle these cases, you know, rather than, than fight them out and face them. And, and look, I will, I will say that, you know, there is an opioid crisis in this country. Opioid addiction, the crisis is a horrible thing. I am sure that, you know, probably everyone in this room, you know, whether it's, you know, you know of someone, a friend's child or someone that has suffered opioid addiction or overdosed. So I don't think any of the companies that, you know, like us that have defended these lawsuits will um, deny that there's an opioid crisis, but I think you don't solve a public health crisis through litigation. And I think that that's ultimately why just, you know, whether it's CVS and Walgreens yesterday or the other companies have decided to settle these cases rather than just to spend probably uh, years, if not decades, fighting these in the courts. David, how have you defended yourself? I mean, um, it, it, <clears throat> a similar vein. Uh, however, I would say on our side in the transportation sector, where we operate close to half a million vehicles, uh, we rely, and I think the best defense is on policy, process, and, and procedure. And that, you know, you you, you look to that, and in, in, in the proliferation of the reptile theory and the transportation cases in particular, I think we have had an enormous emphasis, uh, rightfully so, on safety policies, but making sure that the policies certainly mac match the procedures and what's being done, and then making sure that it matches the technology capabilities, because there can be a disconnect. What happened and what was available uh, on, a, on a vehicle or a product in 2017 may not be the same that it is today. Uh, what happens in litigation is they will oftentimes put you in, put, look through the lens of today back to a, a situation that happened in 17 or 18, and they're not similar. So the way that you defend yourself, the way that we defend ourselves, is paying uh, extraordinary attention to the detail in our processes, in our policies, in our procedures to make sure they're, they're updated and make sure folks are trained properly. So you can tell the story of Penske, which is an extraordinary, uh, you know, American business story, uh, success story. So we want to get that out, 
But as Mike said, you, you will have plaintiffs which will say, yes, we know it's a, a great company, you have a great reputation, but in this instance, you didn't do X. And so what we're really trying to do is, yes, if you're going to put the company on trial, we're there to defend it. But also ensure that, that the actions and the processes company-wide are adhered to. And, that is, and, and we have an enormous amount of effort on that. Let me, let me ask a question that uh, comes up a lot in, in the things that you do. What's been the impact of third-party litigation funding? For both of you. And, uh, well, I can you? say it, is, it, it has really hampered your ability to settle and uh, settle for that? reasonable amounts because the plaintiffs are well-funded. And I think I'll, I'll say that the litigation funders really don't have, in my opinion, the best interest of the plaintiff at heart. They're there because it's a financing technique and PE players come in or whomever and they fund it and they're looking for a return. And oftentimes that return is uh, inflating damages. So I think that uh, they've played an enormous part in, in our ability uh, to settle. And I think when, when Harold had mentioned the 1,376 uh, verdicts, I, uh, I would say that, you know, and this just comes from experience as well, I think the number is, is much greater than that when you look in settlements and how those verdicts have really driven up uh, settlements. Mike? Yeah. Look, I think uh, I, I'm in agreement with that. So look, first of all, you have um, um, portfolios of lawsuits that would not have been brought. And, you know, in particular, you know, when you put the massive numbers of thousands of lawsuits, that, that's, um, that's somewhat sobering, right? And so, first of all, litigation funding without necessarily determining whether or not you know, the plaintiffs have actually you know, been harmed by your product, right? But they amass these very large portfolios. And that's kind of a very daunting situation. But then on the, the individual level, that you know, when you're looking to settle a case uh, for an amount that you know, could be commensurate with the damages, uh, and, and sometimes you're talking about you know, amounts that would be life-changing to the individual plaintiff, mm -hmm. right? That would you know, more than compensate them for any damage and would be incredibly impactful for them and their families. You know, that doesn't meet the rate of return that the third-party litigation funds invested in. And so I think there really is a mismatch between what really should be the, the legitimate focus of the case, which is the plaintiff and whatever injuries or damages they may have suffered versus uh, a fund's you know, anticipated rate of return. So what are, what, what are the most important strategies that you've used to, to fight these cases? Yeah. David, I mean, uh, what, what's been the, the secret sauce? Uh, I wish I knew the secret sauce because we're fighting a lot of them right now. Uh, I, I, again, I think in our context, uh, I think the first, first and foremost being um, my theory on this is being honest and objective in evaluating the case, first of all. Uh, because, you know, we have a lot of folks out there, uh, some of our trucks do, do bump into things. And I think you have to be honest and evaluate the case right up front uh, with our senior management, with our board, and truly understand what you think is the right thing to do immediately, where, where do you stand? So I think an honest evaluation uh, almost comes as the best defense from the outset. Then it goes back to what I was saying uh, before. I think uh, when you're talking about nuclear verdicts, when you're, not talking, when you're talking about a, you know, a verdict and damages that don't bear or aren't commensurate with the compensatory damages, that goes into what I would call a systemic issue. And you have to, we spend an enormous amount of time on systemic issues, whether it's in an accident, whether it's in employment practices and procedures, uh, whether personal injury, you name it. We try to make sure that, that the procedures and the policies are uniformly administered, they're thoughtful, and the training uh, is appropriate. 
for each in, for each area of the country and for each individual. So, Mike, what what has what have you done? I I just for background, I saw you interview the, your CEO about the various crises that you've encountered. How do you prepare your board and your CEO uh, when you're about to go into a case that might be billions of dollars? Yeah, what? you know, Brackett, uh, it's interesting because when David was talking about, you know, how do you defend these cases? And I think my answer would have been, while we're in very different industries and businesses, I think my answer would have been very similar. But a very important part of defending these cases, and in particular, you know, as you've just said, given the, the billions of dollars at risk and, and also the, the reputational impact, is really kind of bringing your board along. And it is something that if I look back at 11 years ago, you know, when I started my role, uh, you know, I would, uh, at board meetings, you know, I would give like a two minute, you know, kind of update. And now, uh, you know, we spend significantly more time with our board talking about the litigation, uh, bringing in outside counsel to, uh, you know, share with them, you know, and, and frankly, it's, I think, in a board's interest, which is with what's, it, 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 when you're doing a, the way I would look at it, because I know a lot of general counsel, when I've had this conversation, kind of feel surprised that you would bring outside counsel to talk to your board. And I look at it, when you're doing M&A, you know, you get your investment bankers to come in and, uh, you know, you want a fairness opinion. The board wants to know that, all right, this is a fair price. And when you're talking about large stakes litigation, I think it's, I, I think it's in my interest, it's in the board's interest, in the CEO's interest, to have outside counsel come in and validate, yes, you know, the company is in the right, this is the right strategy. Um, but you really do need to invest the time to bring your board along. Um, and look, I know the, the common wisdom is, um, you know, there should be no surprises, but that's not realistic. You know, when you're doing the jury trials, you're always gonna have surprises. But at least if you're, um, you know, you're prepared and they understand, okay, you know, we have a, a ongoing trial in Philadelphia and, you know, just there is a possibility of a nuclear verdict. Um, I think that it, it helps. You know, it also helps because, at least in our case, so much of our litigation over the recent years has been very high profile. And you know that board members, whether it's at their, their club or, you know, they're at a neighborhood barbecue, uh, people are going to ask them about the litigation. And, uh, you know, they can be your best ambassadors, as can our employees. But, you know, I've always felt that if your board members uh, understand the litigation, understand kind of what our positioning is, uh, it not only helps to have their support, but then they feel that, you know, they can be ambassadors to the company. How have you managed the media? You know, uh, it, it, Brackett, it, it's interesting because I think uh, when we had a, a pre-call, so I mean, you asked me, like uh, us, David and myself, what's changed, okay, for me in the last 11 years since I've been in this role? I think one thing that has really impacted is I look at the, um, you know, the impact of Law 360. Um, and that's probably the, the main kind of source where, you know, depending upon what time he gets up, like my CEO is reading Law 360 every day. And <laughs> no, I... I, 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 I have a similar... Yeah, and CEO. so, <laughs> you know, it, it is... Uh, and our directors read Law 360. <laughs> and so, you know, that information just gets out there so quickly... Um, so I really don't think that, um, you know, you can necessarily in today's world with social media, with so much, uh, you know, digital material out there, uh, it's very hard to manage the media, but I think that you have to be prepared for the fact that there's going to be information out there on a daily basis. Um, 
I also think that we have adapted our strategy. Um, you know, I think a lot of large companies, uh, you know, if you go back 10 years ago, um, kind of felt like that we would stay above the fray. You know, the classic line when, you know, I was young was, we don't comment on litigation, right? And the reality is in today's world, you have to comment yeah. on litigation. You can no longer say we don't comment on active litigation. And I think that we have begun, you know, talking to Law 360 more. We have begun looking to get our side of the story out because I think you have to do that in today's world. David, you know, does Roger Pesky read Law 360? <laughs> so I should just mention that, yeah. that Roger Pensky, his ultimate boss, was a, was a director at GE. Yeah. And Mike, one of Mike Ullman's bosses was also a director at GE <laughs> in the same time. Ro Roger's very, very well informed. Uh, he, he certainly is. Uh, I couldn't agree more with, with Mike. Um, I think you used to have the conventional, the conventional journals uh, that you'd looked at the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and you'd had time to react, and you didn't just wake up in the morning. There was, there was a different level to it now. And it's funny, I didn't think of this, but Law 360 has become the conduit through which verdicts or difficult cases uh, or anything, uh, transactions are being conveyed. So I firmly believe that, uh, one, if you keep your board informed, your chairman informed, uh, then you do have buy-in and, and you do have a, a, a singular way that you're going to handle things. Um, and yes, we have done the same thing. We have started, I'll say we're going on the offensive, but it's really just, it's not that. It's, it's telling uh, the true story, our objective story, if we believe that's the case. And, uh, and, and so we've, we've started to, to shy away from the no comment on litigation stance as well. Uh, there's just too many platforms that are out there that go unchecked. And so I think in this world with social media, digital media, you need to get your, your story, you need to get the facts, you need to get the counterpoint out. Uh, and you can be dexterous in handling that, but uh, you have to do it. It's a, I think it's a completely different strategy. Uh, before I open it up to audience questions, uh, one quick question for you both is, where do you go for help? Other than my therapist, uh, no. Uh, no um, look, I, I think that you um, networking your colleagues, look, someone like you, Brackett, who has been through these situations before, I do think having a network is really important. I think having colleagues that you trust, um, look, we have an incredible um, you know, team of our outside counsel who we've worked with for years. And so, uh, yeah, look, I think that there are great resources. Harold and his team have been a phenomenal resource for us in many cases. So, um, yeah, unlike, uh, I guess, the attorney general who was putting in plugs for the Commonwealth, I'm putting in plugs for Harold <laughs> here. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's, uh, it's really, you have to work your network. I think that's really what I would say. I, I, I agree. I have, probably like everyone, there's a couple of senior folks at, at, at firms that we use a lot that I, I trust uh, wholeheartedly and implicitly. And, uh, and I find them to have very uh, varied experience with strategic mindset. And there I call, I'm thinking of two or three in particular, uh, they do a lot of work for us. They understand us. So I think that's the one thing that uh, that I have found really helps is making ensuring that those individuals not only understand whether it's my personality but the company's personality, who we are, what we represent, so they know the the direction we're going they, immediately, um, and they have uh, they've worked with us, they've developed a familiarity, and so I think that's that's crucial to have that bank of folks. So. Let me open it up for any questions from the audience. We got two here. The prior panel talked a little bit about the importance of consistency uh, and um, predictability in the business environment. And I'm just wondering, 
uh, you know, whether it's, do, do you feel your company's getting whipsawed between uh, administrations and executive orders they issue, uh, but between regulatory environment, state to state, or even on the ESG front, those that are pushing ESG hard and now anti-ESG movements. And so are you feeling this? What, if anything, are you doing about it? And or where do you see it going? Well, uh, well I would just say yeah, yes to all of it. Uh, yes, we're uh, feeling it. Um, the regulatory environment is, is extraordinarily challenging, and especially when you do... For, for your investors, for the markets, I think the one thing that, that they need is certainty and predictability. And it is very difficult. In fact, I think one of the troubling trends that, that you see from a, a compliance perspective is the gross disparity between cities and states and federal regulation. Uh, what happens in Cook County uh, Illinois is very different than what happens in Springfield. What happens in Manhattan is very different than Broome County, New York. So um, I find that to be an extraordinarily difficult issue because there, it's, it's hard to achieve certainty. It's hard to achieve uh, regularity. And that, that permeates through everything, ESG, uh, everything. So I think it's a, it's a very, very, very difficult climate out there. And I would say in the wake of the West Virginia case, um, and, and I know we talked a little bit this morning about the SEC uh, climate-related disclosures. You can extrapolate that to a number of different initiatives. Uh, predictability is very difficult. Where are we going to land? And that impacts your organization uh, tremendously because you're, devo you're, you're devoting resources and capex into these things, but where and why and how much um, is, is uncertain, even if your purposes are, are noble and compliant. I know, we can go to them. One more yeah. question, I think we yeah, have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned uh, in the context of third party litigation funding that you're getting word that there might be funders behind it. I think we're familiar with the great work that the chamber has been doing about disclosure and prompting that and compelling that. What are the other ways that you're getting word of uh, their presence? Um, how we're learning about third party litigation funding, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, look, I think it, it, um, it varies, right? There are times where you can ask the judge to you know, share that or to, to order that. Uh, that certainly helps. Um, look, it is, it's very much a patchwork. And I think, uh, look, a little bit if I tie it into the question that was just asked about certainty and, and predictability, certainly if that were, if it were known exactly you know, who the third party litigation fund was and what the terms of their funding were, I think that would be extremely helpful in being able to navigate through the, the system to try to navigate settlements and also, frankly, in some cases for the judge to, uh, you know, potentially and appropriately take a more aggressive stance with the litigation funders uh, if the judge feels that the actual plaintiff is, you know, being appropriately provided for. And so I do think it really all comes from uh, full disclosure. You know, it, that's an issue uh, in development. I, I think it's, um, it, it, it's horrible that we don't have uh, the right disclosure about funding, it, 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 even to defend it, it's in the darkness, it makes no sense at all. And that, that the chamber has, has led on this, the ILR has, has led on it. So with that, um, a thanks to these Thank two fantastic gentlemen. Thank you to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. As, as usual, you knock it out of the park. Always a pleasure.